God Almighty reigns. First Thessalonians chapter 5, um, verses 1 through 11. <clears throat> the word of God says, But of the times and the season, brethren, ye need that I write unto you. For yourselves, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them and travail upon woman and child, and they shall not escape. But ye brethren are not in darkness that the day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep in the night and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us be who, let us be who are of the day, sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whatever we wake or sleep, we should live together within him. And verse 11 says, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. I've just word, read God's word for God's people. Yeah, 
Good morning. I say good morning to friendship. Everyone that's in the sound of my voice this morning. Say, Father, I stretch my hand to thee. No other hand or no other help. I know. And if thou wilt draw thyself, thy help from us, tell us. Oh, weather, oh, weather shall we go. I could, I say good morning, Daddy. I come to say we praise you and we thank you for all you've done for us and we just glorify your holy name. We thank you for your wonderful son, Jesus, that died and is now risen, and he rings on the right hand of the throne with you, Father. We say thank you. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that indwells us and keeps us. Oh. Oh, most precious Lord. Uh, oh, Lord. Uh, so many trials and tribulations do we face today. But, Lord, you say, uh, many are the afflictions of the righteous. But you will deliver us out of them all. And we said, thank you. We thank you because you're omnipotent. You're all powerful. We thank you because you're omnipresent. You're everywhere all the time. And we thank you for your omniscience. You're all knowing. Lord, uh, I pray for the leader of this church. I shepherd James Bean. I pray for all the other men that works with him, Lord. Uh, Pastor Burns, uh, Reverend Thomas, Reverend Fouts, and all their families. I pray for our people that's out in the audience right now. Some at home, not feeling well, not doing well. Some might be in the hospital. Lord, you already know. We don't have to call names, but you're already there. So, Lord, we say thank you this morning. We thank you that you hear this prayer from these lips of clay that I present to you this day. We thank you for the deliverance of this word to you by your son, Jesus. I'm so glad to be in the house today. Lord, we see as the pandemic runs rampant across the land, we know, Lord, that we got to continue to stand. We got men making promises, Lord, that without you, they can't even keep them. So, Lord, we, we love you. We adore you. We magnify you. Your glorious name and your holy name. Lord, I pray for our musicians today that they will play and pray and play with the anointing. Lord, we pray for our preacher man. Lord, give him an anointing that he would preach like never before. So, Lord, uh, there's many blessings and I can ask. But, Lord, I just say, glory! Hallelujah. I say thank you because you've been so good to us. Lord, I don't just call myself out. I call all out. I call all the sick. Lord, I call all the downtrodden. I 
every reason I ask them to stand and keep on walking. Because, Lord, you're soon to come. And, Lord, let us be ready to receive you. These prayers and these blessings and many more I could ask. In your dear son Jesus' name, I say, but they ain't not the kingdom. The power and the glory. I say, amen. Morning, friendship. To our gracious and humble leader, Pastor James A. Bing, our associate ministers, the friendship family, visitors, and friends. Again, I say good morning to all of you. It's so good to see everyone this morning. Uh, I'm again delighted, as always, to stand before you on this day, the day that the Lord has made. So let us rejoice and be glad in it. We are here today only, only because of the grace of God. And we're excited today about Jesus. And we're excited about all that he has done, he is doing, and what he will continue to do for us all. For we know that it is only because of the great love and mercy for us all that we are even here today. So he's watched over us all week long. He's kept us all week long. And today we simply pause just to say thank you, Lord. We're thrilled that you have chosen to worship with us today for there is nothing quite like joining with people in a sense of unity with the single purpose of bringing praise and honor to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Each and every Sunday, we enter this sanctuary with great anticipation of what God wants to do in each of our lives. There is, can be no doubt whatsoever that God is a personal God who cares very deeply about every issue that we are concerned about. So at this time, I would like to extend a special invitation to all of our first time visitors, or maybe it's not your first time visiting with us, but it may be your second, third, fourth, but you are visiting with the Friendship family today. I would like for you to stand uh, so that the Friendship family may acknowledge you and uh, give us just a little bit of information about yourselves if we have any visitors visiting with us today. So we're all family today, and that's good, because friendship, we have a Christian duty to love each other and to love others always, just as Christ, unworthy as we are, as we always are, as he shows that same kind of love to us always. So I encourage you today to go about your daily lives. I wish you all the best, and I wish you all a gracious and holy week. God bless you. Amen. Thank you. I needed to hear that this morning. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, our Father, we come before your throne. First, Father, give you thanks for the opportunity to stand before these, your people. And now, Father, as I stand, I ask that you place me behind the cross and that you give me the words to say to your people. Give me the power to speak to them. We thank you now for this opportunity again, Father. We beckon your Holy Spirit to come in this place. Fill our hearts with your word. We ask, Father, that you create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. And that you allow the words of my mouth and a meditation of my heart to be acceptable to you. This I pray and ask in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Bing, and to my fellow clergy, Reverend Alan Thomas, presiding to Reverend Michael Faust and his wife and child, and to uh, Reverend Billy Thomas and Miss Thomas, and to my wife Shirley, and to all of you who thought it not robbery to come out and share a word with the Lord. As I was sitting there and the Rashid was playing Yield Not to Temptation, I was like Mike, I was taken back because 
when I start thinking about how good God has been. Uh, I was sitting there, my eyes started to fill with water because I was, I'm just so thankful and so grateful for all that God has done for me. And not only me, but for my family and for this nation as we go and struggle through trying times. God is still able and God is still on the throne. So I'm just humbled to be standing here this morning to speak to you. If you have a copy of the scriptures, would you turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5? 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And in it you will find these words beginning at verse 16. Therefore, this is the New King James Version. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh. Yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is what that is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. If you don't mind, I'd like to to read another version that I kind of like that I want to share with you. It's the CEB, the Common English Bible, and it reads like this. So then from this point on, we won't recognize people by human standards. Even though we used to know Christ by human standards, that isn't how we know him now. So then, if anyone is in Christ, that person is part of the new creation. The old things have gone away, and look, new things have arrived. All of these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and who gave us the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, God was reconciling the world to himself through Christ by not counting people's sins against them. He has trusted us with this message of reconciliation. So we are ambassadors who represent Christ. God is negotiating with you through us. We beg you as Christ's representatives, be reconciled to God. God calls the one who did not know, did no sin to be sin for our sake so that through him we could become the righteousness of God. Amen. My subject for this morning is the new you. The new you. As I have matured in life, God has given me grace enough to have several memorable experiences. As I reflect on life and think about this word new, it is usually brought or thought about from a flesh or worldly position or perspective. Let me give you a few examples of what I'm talking about. At some point in our lives, we are going to have the experience of receiving something new. New is defined as something that has never existed or ever been experienced. 
I tell you, there is something about receiving or experiencing the newness of something. It's something that you never had or experienced that brings out the gratitude or joy of having this new item or new experience. There is just something about newness. The smell of a new car. The shine and luster or glow. The opportunity to experience a new home, a new apartment, new clothes, new shoes, a new girlfriend or a new wife, a new baby or grandchild. There is something about those things that sometimes delivers to us a false sense of security that tells us we have arrived. Uh, toys under a Christmas tree, a, a brand new Easter basket, a brand new job are not the most important things in the world. You see, there is an interesting dynamic when it comes to worldly new things. And that is, they get old. They lose the new smell. Uh, they lose the shine or glitter. So they are eventually put away. Have you ever noticed how kids get new toys and after a few days, maybe even a few hours, that toy can be found sitting aside because it's lost its newness. It's lost its luster. Another thing about new items, we occasionally want people to notice them. We want people to look at our new stuff. And if they don't notice it right away, we have a way to tell them or say to them, hey, you see my new car or my new house. I wonder what would happen if they didn't notice it. How would we respond? The fact of the matter is, out of all the things I've talked about this morning, none of them compare to a new relationship with Christ. Uh, Matthew 6.33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. What I have also come to understand and realize about new things is when people see you with something new, rather than be happy for you, they become envious and jealous and, or curious. Child, where did they get that from? They think they something else. He think he all that now that he has his new stuff. So newness in that regard can cause confusion or conflict. What I've also learned is nothing happens serendipitously or by chance. God has purposed us and given us all that we have and need to utilize for his glory. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, Peter reminds his listeners of this very fact. He says to them, his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Paul says in Romans 8, 28, one of my favorite scriptures, that all things, all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. I say to my wife from time to time, we are in the school business now, Monica. We are uh, schooling our grandkids and I, I talk to her sometimes about how smart and how bright they are. And though they are bright and smart, I also want them to understand that the word is the most important thing. And it is also our obligation to make sure that we place the word in them, that they understand who God is. I was sitting in the front room and Christian was doing his lunch and I heard him, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And at the end, he said, in Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Right. And I, I said, Shirley, did you hear that? 
He said, no. I said, Christian in there praying. And he came out, I said, Christian, what were you praying for? He said, you heard me? I said, yeah, I heard you. But we, it's our responsibility yeah, 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 yeah. as Christians, as families, to make sure that our children has that word in them so that they can experience the newness of Christ. Uh -huh. We also can't afford not to treat our relationship like a toy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because what you must understand is that what we are experiencing are things that are going to pass away. What we're looking for is eternity or something eternal. And the only thing that I can tell you that is eternal is Christ. All those other things will soon leave you and you will be left on the outside looking in. So we can't afford to treat our relationship with Christ like a new toy. We must continue to water it, fertilize it, breathe it, read it, live it. And as someone reminded us in Bible study last week, we must also practice it. In the church of Corinth, Paul had a concern that new Christians in the church were being misled by false teachers and focused in on the wrong things. You see, like us, the church of Corinth was weak. It was surrounded by idolatry and immorality. They struggled with their Christian faith and lifestyle. Through personal visits and letters, Paul tried to instruct them in their faith, resolve their conflicts, and solve some of their problems. Paul wrote this letter to Corinth to defend his position and to denounce those who were twisting the truth. We will be wise as children of God to listen to Paul as well and not allow ourselves to get caught up with those who twist God's word for their own agenda and gain. In the passage scripture before us, Paul makes this statement or declaration to the people. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things are passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry, the ministry of reconciliation. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, oh neighbor, you're looking mighty good today. Look at him one more time and say, neighbor, I'm new. Look at the other neighbor and say, neighbor, you new too. We are new creations. Paul is reminding them of their past or former life and how they, should, how they should put behind them those things and how they should not listen to false teachers. And Paul begins to go to work on them from the beginning because in chapter three, verses four and six, he says to them, and we have such trust through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. And then later in verses 16 and 18, he says, nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. And now the Lord is the spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with unveiled faces, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the spirit of the Lord. 
The veil of Moses on Moses' face was an illustration of the fading of the old system. When we accept Christ as our personal savior, things should change. We should change. There's an old saying that is utilized during the new year. Out with the old and in with the new. But somehow we don't want to empty ourselves. We want to hold on to those old things. You can't get anything if your hand is always clenched. You can't get anything if you're already full of something that you don't need. Christ wants to give you eternal life. Christ wants to give you the things that you need to see Jesus Christ again. But if we continue to hold on to those things that are not of God, then we are going to be without God. If we are in Christ, we are new. And it should be evident. In Romans 4, 6, 4 through 6, Paul asks a simple question. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we are also should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Paul is taking the church of Corinth in this same direction. If we say we are in Christ, we must die to sin. Because when we are in Christ, we are new. We have a new walk. We have a new talk. We have a new mind. And we must be willing to die to self. And be willing to make sacrifices and do whatever necessary to serve Christ. Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. We knew. We got to act like we knew. We got to walk like we knew. We got to talk like we do. We can't be new and still doing the same thing our homies doing. We got to change who we are. In other words, we should live for Christ since he died for us. And not live for our own gain. You see, when you have an encounter with God, things change. And there should be a change in you. We must be like Job and wait for our change to come. If you don't mind, I'd like to just give you a few references of what happens when you have an encounter with God. In the book of Exodus, Moses was placed as a child in a basket put in a river found by Pharaoh's sister. 
got placed in the power of Egypt, the very city that initially wanted to kill him. However, he killed a man and had to flee the city. He ended up in the desert and went, went from riches to rags. And then one day in the mountains, he had an encounter with God. He saw a burning bush that was not consumed by fire. And the Lord spoke through the bush and said to Moses, take off your shoes because the ground in which you're standing is a holy ground. And he was never the same after that. And at the age of 80, God used him to deliver his people out of Egypt. In the book of Samuel, there was David, a shepherd's boy, was called and anointed by Samuel at God's request. And the Bible says from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. He killed Goliath with a stone and was elevated to work with King Saul who tried to kill him. However, David would become king after his encounter with God. In Genesis 37, Joseph the dreamer was thrown into prison, betrayed by his brothers, accused of assault on Potiphar's wife, got thrown into prison, went from despair and hopelessness to triumph, and a man who would save a nation from a famine and reunite with his family. I tell you, when you encounter God and build a relationship with him, things change. In Genesis 32, Jacob wrestled with God and received a blessing. And God asked him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And then God said to him, your name won't be Jacob any longer, but Israel, because you struggled with God and with men and won. I tell you, when you have an encounter with God, things change. In the book of Jonah, there was Jonah who went from being disobedient to obedient. In the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah wanted to stop preaching, but couldn't stop preaching. He said, because it's like the word of God is like fire, all shut up in my bone. In Matthew 14, Peter walked on water because of his relationship with Christ. And then in chapter 16, like Jacob, Peter gets a name change from Simon Barjona uh, to Peter. God asked, Jesus asked the question, who do men say that I am? And after he heard his response, Jesus replies and said, flesh and blood could not have told you that. And upon this rock or this truth, I will build my church. In the book of Acts, the most well-documented encounter with Christ in the Bible took place. Paul, a persecutor, the author of this book, formerly known as Saul, would also get a name change. He would go on to be one of God's greatest servants. On his way to Damascus, on Damascus Road, he encountered God, got knocked down from his horse, blinded and was never the same. I tell you, when you have an encounter with God, things change. You should change. With all this said, Paul had a big picture in mind. He was trying to prepare the people of Corinth for the inevitable. He wanted them to understand that this is not the end of the story. It's the beginning because after death, where do you go? This was an eternal thing. Paul wanted them to understand that Jesus didn't die for nothing or in vain. He died for a purpose and he died because he loved us. So Paul was giving them the T.D. Jakes version. Get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. So if we are going to fully seize what Jesus died for, 
then we have to go back to the beginning of this book. You're probably wondering what, what, what was Paul trying to do or say? I'm glad you asked. If you saw that, allow me to read verse one. For we know that when it's earthly tent we live in, it's taken down. It's gonna fall and crumble. That is when we die and leave this earthly body, we should have a house in heaven. The eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. He goes on to say, we long to put on our heavenly bodies like new clothing for we will put on heavenly bodies. We will not be spirits without bodies. While we live in these bodies, we groan and sigh. But it's not what we want. It's not that we want to die and get rid of these bodies that clothe us. Rather, we want to put on our new bodies so that these dying bodies will be swallowed up by life. God himself has prepared for us and as a guarantee he has given us his Holy Spirit. So we are new. He died. Paul is telling them why he died. But because he died and because we are supposed to know who he is, uh-huh. suppose, because we are supposed to be serving him, because we are supposed to have a relationship with him, we must change. We must be new creation. Just as John was preparing the way for Jesus, Jesus was, is preparing the way for us. Jesus said during his time of preparation, he said to them, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, be also in me. In my father's house, the old tent's gonna fall down. And there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know. And the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. And how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's a song entitled New Jerusalem, and the lyrics go like this. Somewhere we know, but haven't been, like a song forgotten, a place prepared beyond the end, our home in New Jerusalem, a palace made of promises, a garden and a fortress, a world that builds on what you said, our home in New Jerusalem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our home in New Jerusalem, uh-huh. standing there in purest light, yeah, yeah. with no more pain and no more night. He holds the tears we have cried, all right, all right. the bride of New Jerusalem, yeah, yeah, yeah. who filled with love will give his life right. to save his one and only bride, uh-huh. whose name is true yeah. and lifted high, right. the king of New Jerusalem. The king of New Jerusalem, his will is done. His kingdom come, eternity has begun. The multitude will sing as one the song of New Jerusalem. A music free from bars of time, a sympathy of his design. The lamb of God enthroned on high, the hope, the hope of New Jerusalem. So where are you trying to take us, Paul? Where, where is it you want us to go? 
you still may be asking that. Well, Jesus wants us in a land of no more, yeah, 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 yeah. where all things are new. All right. Revelation 21, John says, now I saw a new heaven, a new earth from the first heaven, and the first earth had passed away. All right, all right. Also, there was no more sea. Yes, then I, John, saw the holy city, yeah. New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven yeah. saying, Behold, yeah. the tabernacle of God is with men, yeah. and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. Yeah. Yeah. God himself will be with them yeah. and be their God. Right. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Yeah. There shall be no more death, yeah. nor sorrow, nor crying. There should be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then who ye who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am, I am, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning in the end. However, in order for all of this to take place, Jesus had to die. And that's what Paul was trying to convey to his audience. And it wasn't an easy death. He died that we might die. When Christ died, we died in him and with him. Therefore, the old life should no longer hold us today. Because we were crucified with him, according to Galatians 2.20. He died that we might live through him and shares the new creation. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I don't think you heard me. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. But on his way to the cross, he had to let them know who he was. So on his way to the cross, he stopped by a tomb where Lazarus was. People said he was dead. But Christ said, wait a minute, or hold up. Call Lazarus by name. Lazarus came walking from the grave. On his way to the cross, he took two fish and five loaves of bread and fed a multitude. On his way to the cross, he met a man that had been crippled for 38 long years, told him to take up his bed and walk. On his way to the cross, he stopped at a wedding and, and turned water into wine. On his way to the cross, he stopped by Jairus' house, took care of his daughter, healed her with a word. On his way to the cross, he died for our sins, that we should have the newness of life. Because if we are in Christ, we are a new creation. And I'm also reminded, Mike, that every time I think about where Christ has brought me from and the goodness that he's been, how good he's been to me. Uh, because I have a relationship with him, uh, I have to remind myself from time to time that I was sinking deep in sin, far from a peaceful shore, very deeply staying within, seeking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, and from the waters he lifted me. Now safe am I. Because I have a relationship with Christ, I got a new walk. Because I have a relationship with Christ, I got a new talk. Because I have a relationship with Christ, I have a new song. Because I have a relationship with Christ, I have a new peace. Because I have a relationship with Christ, I have a new love. Because I have a relationship with Christ, I have a new destination. Because of Christ, I have a new mind. Because of Christ, I have a new hope. Because of Christ, I have a new Lord and a, and a new Savior. I wish I had a witness in here today 
Because of Christ, I have a new strength. Because of Christ, I have a new talk. Because of Christ, I have a new joy. And the joy I have, the world didn't give it to me. And the world couldn't take it away. Listen to Kirk Carr the other day, and he said these words. I got so much to thank God for. So many wonderful blessings and so many open doors. A brand new mercy along with each new day. That's why I praise you. For this I give you praise. For waking me up this morning. That's why I praise you for starting me on my way. That's why I praise you for letting me see the sunshine of a brand new day and a brand new mercy along with each new day. That's why I praise you for this I give you praise. You are Jehovah Jireh. That's why I praise you. You've been my provider. That's why I praise you. So many times you met my need. So many times you rescued me. That's why I praise you. I want to thank you for the blessing you give me each day. That's why I praise you. For this, I give you praise. And then he finishes off with the chorus. For every mountain, come on in here somebody. For every mountain, you brought me over. For every trial, you sing me through. For every blessing, hallelujah. Ha hallelujah. For this, for this, for this, Y'all don't hear me today. For this, for this I give you praise. He's a good God. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I own about. Lord, plant my feet. Plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up where I can stand. I, I, I can't speak for you. Let me put this. God has been good to me. I don't know about you or where he's brought you from, but he brought me from a mighty long way. And every time I think about the goodness of the Lord, in my despair, he gives me hope. In my trials, he gives me triumph. In my weakness, he gives me strength. God is good, not just some of the time. God is good all the time. I don't know about you, but he woke me up this morning, started me on my way. I got clapping in my hands. I got running in my feet. I got a tongue that I can talk. Better yet, I got a tongue that I can praise him. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Because you are Christ, I am new. Thank you, Lord. Good morning, Friendship. You can now give your tithes and offerings electronically through a link on the internet, a text to give number, or through a mobile app called Give Plus. Now for those who are comfortable giving in the old school way of writing a check or money order, you can still do that by sending a check payable to Friendship Baptist Church at the address listed on screen. But for those who would like to use a safe mobile app, a secure web link, or to easily send a text to give your tithes and offerings, this system is now available. For more information, please view the videos that follow or click the link below to send an offering online. In today's fast moving world, smartphones are integrated into our lives. We bank and shop on our smartphones, and many of us want to give with them too. Giving to the church with a text message is fast, easy, and versatile. With Give Plus Text, you can make a weekly offering or respond to a special appeal in just seconds. To give, you enter the church's 10-digit Give Plus Text number and the amount you wish to donate. Then, send your text. The first time you contribute with Give Plus Text, you'll receive a secure registration link. Click the link to go to our secure website where you'll enter your contact and payment information. Tap Process when you're done. After you've completed your registration, a text reply will verify that your gift has been received. We'll also email you a receipt. For future giving, you simply send a text with the amount you wish to give and it will process automatically. 
You can also choose to make your gift recurring. Gift Plus Text is that easy. Register, give, 